series of lessons that I compiled after reading a, an article that I mentioned several weeks ago. We began with a sermon entitled, Why the Church Doesn't Change. Last week we did a sermon entitled, There is a Difference <coughs> Regarding the Differences Between Doctrinal Matters and Matters of Opinion and Differences Between Being Faithful and Unfaithful, Differences Between uh, Matters Which Are uh, Circumstantial and Matters Which Are Commanded or Authorized. And today we will look at the topic of autonomy, church autonomy. Autonomy is a word that is not actually found in the New Testament, but the principle of autonomy is seen throughout the New Testament. Defined, autonomy means independent, free, and self-directing. As we look at the organization of the church as presented in the New Testament, and as it applies to the work of the church in the New Testament, we find that these, uh, these terms that define autonomy are ever-present in every congregation throughout the New Testament. They were independent one of another. They were free and self-directing. And so the idea expressed through autonomy is clearly expressed through the New Testament. It is a biblical principle. And just with any, just as it is the case with any biblical principle, this biblical principle can and has been uh, used uh, or abused. And just because uh, a principle has been abused doesn't make it wrong. It just means that it's been abused. And so the idea of autonomy has been abused as it was in this particular article that I read. And so I wanted us to examine the expression of autonomy as it is uh, seen in the New Testament and discuss what autonomy does not mean and then conclude with what autonomy does mean. In 1 Peter chapter 5 verses 1 through verse 4, we see autonomy expressed in the fact that God ordained elders to oversee each local congregation. That each congregation was to be uh, self-governing from that standpoint. The Apostle Peter writes, The elders which are among you, I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And so here in the uh, governance of the local congregation, we see that there are elders or in the case uh, of a congregation where elders are not qualified or men are not qualified to serve as elders, the men of that congregation are authorized to execute God's will as it pertains to the local church. And you'll note in 1 Peter chapter 5 that the elders were men who were among that group of individuals. They didn't come from an outside source. Many denominations today uh, send leadership from one place to another. Or when uh, preachers or uh, whatever term they use to describe or define their preachers are needed in a particular uh, location, sometimes they are uh, sent or moved from place to place. And that is done by some organization or some individuals who are not among that group of people. The autonomy of the church here is thus seen in the fact that the elders were men who were among that group of people in that location. And they were authorized and commanded to feed the flock among you, verse 2. In other words, there's no, we don't read of any group of men or individuals 
who were to oversee all flocks or a group of flocks. Elders were to oversee the flock among which they were one of. The group that they were among, that's the group they were to oversee. There was no overseeing elders who were overseeing them. In other words, there's no uh, hierarchy like we might have House of Representatives or Senators uh, or State Representatives or State Senators. The elders of that local congregation were to oversee the flock. They were overseen not by a convention or a group of individuals, but by one man, verse 4, the chief shepherd. Which means they answered to God. They answered to the Lord. They didn't answer to any other man. They didn't answer to any group of men. And so each local congregation has individuals who are... uh, who are serving to oversee that local congregation, who they're among, they're a part of the group, they've come out among that group, and their head is only the chief shepherd. There's no group of individuals or organization that is above them, between them and God. And that expresses autonomy of each local congregation. That they were to oversee that flock, no no eldership from another city or area could come and oversee our flock or our congregation that's not authorized by God. Each local congregation was to uh, be self-directing in other words. Each local congregation is commanded to assemble on the first day of the week Acts 20 verse 7 Hebrews 10 24 and 25. Upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread uh, Paul recounts in Acts 20 verse 7 we note that he preached until midnight But they came together every first day of the week. And it might be noted that in that particular context, he was speaking to the church at Ephesus, and he was speaking particular to the elders who were members of that church who were overseeing that flock. Right? They were responsible for that congregation. But they were meeting upon the first day of the week. Autonomy is therefore expressed through the assembling of the local congregation. The the church universal, that is, every individual who is a member of the Church of Christ worldwide, is never commanded to meet. (laughs) In other words, God never commanded the church to meet in a group that was less than the church or greater than the church, local. And so we see autonomy in the local church. Each local congregation is commanded to evangelize. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 verses 6 through verse 8. Paul commends the church at Thessalonica. Saying, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. In other words, each local congregation, in particular, this example at Thessalonica, was able to evangelize on its own. It didn't need the assistance of something larger than the local church to do the job of evangelism. Uh, the, tr- the work of evangelism was left to the local church. So much so that, the, that Paul commends here the church at Thessalonica for doing its job well. Each congregation is commanded to edify its own body. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11, Comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. And of course, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25, we find that assembling in and of itself is a means by which we edify one another. When we gather together and we enjoy the, the singing together and the fellowship together and the listening to the word together and the growing together, we edify one another. And that is done on the local level, the local congregation level. In Acts chapter 6, we see uh, 
the institution of what we would probably refer to as the, the deacon, the position of the deacon. And in instituting this position, we see that the work was local and the individuals that were participating in that work were local. And that the work that they were participating in this particular example was that of benevolence. So we can see a lot about autonomy in this particular context. We see that there were local men in that local area taking care of a local need, right? In those days when the number of the disciples were multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples to them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye among you, seven men of honest report. Look among you. These men were to come out from among them, just like the elders. Uh, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. In other words, the local congregation had individuals who could take care of that business. They were self-directing. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. Which we'll get back to uh, before we end this lesson, but... There, there are works that apply to every individual Christian and every local congregation and the church universal equally. And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man of faith and of the Holy Spirit and Philip and uh, Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenius and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And so we see here that the work of benevolence was able to be taken care of locally by local men. Uh, so the church was doing its job locally. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 through verse 4, points out that each local congregation could take up its own collection in order to provide for itself and to take care of the needs in that community and they were to obviously do so on the first day of the week as it is a act of worship and worship takes place on the first day of the week concerning the collection for the saints as I have given order to the churches of Galatia even so do ye so this is a, a command that applied to every church equally every local church equally the churches in Galatia were taking up their collection and the church in Corinth was taking up its collection. There wasn't a universal collection, in other words. There wasn't a universal collection. Each local congregation took up its own collection. Uh, upon the first day of the week, it's an act of worship. Let every one of you lay by him in store. It's an individual command, but it was also a congregational command, right? He said, I told, you, I told the church at Galatia to do it, and I'm telling the church here to do it. So it's a congregational command command and then he says let every one of you that means it's an individual command so it's equal between individual Christians and the congregation as a whole let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come and of course they had uh, set aside this particular collection for needy saints at Jerusalem In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we see the essence of autonomy through discipline. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul said, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. That is the local congregation there. And the sin doesn't necessarily have to be fornication, but the sin was a public sin. So much as... Uh, named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. So this is an example of a sin that was causing problems in the local congregation, but it's not, that's not the only sin that would cause a problem. It could be any public sin, right? The point here is, he said, this sin is in your midst, right? Your congregation, and it's your responsibility to take care of it. Verse 2, you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, you should have been crying because this individual is separating themselves from God. 
that he had done this, that deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that's by his authority, by God's authority, when you are gathered together, that's the local church, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, by apostolic authority and by the Lord's power, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So disciplining members or making sure that individuals uh, of that local congregation are brought uh, to repentance, if need be, over matters of public sin is a work of the local church. And it wasn't exported to Paul, an apostle, even though he had authority to present the means by which that took place. But Paul said, this is your responsibility. In fact, every time, some people might say, well, every example that you read there is the, the, the apostles were doing it. Well, in the first century, the apostles were leading the way because we, this had never been done before. You needed somebody to explain what to do. But notice how they were doing it. This is just one time, and we'll see throughout this sermon, where Paul was explaining, here's what you do. This is your responsibility. And so we see autonomy in that. We also see autonomy in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3, um, the seven congregations of Asia, right? The seven churches of Asia. He begin, Jesus begins by talking to the church at Ephesus. He says, I know your works. And then he goes to the another congregation and another. And we read of seven different congregations and all of them had different things said about them. That is an expression of autonomy. When one of those congregations did something wrong, it did not necessarily mean the other congregations were wrong because they were free and self-directing. But they had their own needs, just like the church at Corinth had its own needs. And so that's the reason these individuals uh, sent apostles or wrote letters to help each congregation deal with these issues. And then we have it combined for us today so that we can deal with any issue that arises. So autonomy is obviously expressed throughout the New Testament. Now, what autonomy does not mean or does not allow, it does not mean that local congregations can make their own rules. Or, by that I mean change any of God's rules. Many have abused the idea of autonomy to say, well, you know, we can do what we want to do and you all do what you want to do. Well, in a sense, that's accurate. Only if... What we are doing and you are doing is authorized by God. <laughs> you don't have the right to do a thing just because you have autonomy. You have the right to do a thing only if God authorizes it or commands it. Now, if God authorizes it or commands it, then you can execute it how you want to and we can execute it how we want to. For instance, we, we choose to use songbooks to execute the command to sing. Somebody might use PowerPoint and put the, the words on a, on a screen. Okay, we're doing two different things, but both are equally authorized or commanded. But a congregation cannot just say, well, we're autonomous and we'll do, uh, we're going to add a, a piano or, a, or a, a contemporary service. Right? They don't have, because, and it's not because we say they can't do it or it's not because we don't do it. It's because they don't have authority from God to do it. See, it all goes back to that. Autonomy also does not mean that local congregations can scripturally fellowship things that God does not. In the article that I reference, the idea of unity was the emphasis of the article. And as I pointed out several weeks ago when we started this, unity is something that we crave. Right? Unity is something that God commanded and desired. So much so that he gave us everything that we needed to have unity. One God, one Lord, one faith, one hope, one baptism. Right? Ephesians chapter 4. So 
unity is obviously something that we should strive for. But unity in that article was presented as whatever anybody does, let's just agree that we're autonomous, that they can choose how to do it and we can choose how to do it. No, you, autonomy, that's not autonomy. That's not what autonomy is. Autonomy doesn't mean that we ignore error. Things that are being done outside the fellowship of God. In Acts chapter 15, in Acts chapter 15, verse 20, there was an issue, you'll remember, uh, dealing with Christians who had converted out of Judaism who were commanding that Gentiles be circumcised. And uh, this caused a big problem, so much so that the apostles had to meet. But notice what they did. Uh, verse 20, it says that we write unto them. So here's, here's a congregation that's autonomous. But this, this ind these individuals, these elders, along with the apostles, said we're going to write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. Now that was things that uh, Gentiles who had not been uh, uh, acquainted with Jewish policies, Jewish individuals who were acquainted with Jewish policies once they converted to Christianity didn't have association with these things already. But Gentiles may have not known and so they needed some instruction. So they wrote to them. But here's the primary thing. The primary thing uh, in this particular context was in verse 23. So we see them saying, no, you need, to, you need to abstain from these things. These things are error. It doesn't matter if you're autonomous or not. You all need to know about this. Now notice an eldership didn't command them to change, but, a, but an eldership did send them a letter and say, these things, you need to abstain from these things. Not because we said it, but because God said it. But not only did they send a letter uh, stating that there were things that they were doing that was not in fellowship with God. Notice what they did in verse 23. They wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren. So a congregation sending a letter to another congregation. Not butting into their business, but letting them know either A, you're doing things that are not authorized by God, or B, in this case, uh, we send greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria, for as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words subverting your soul, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law to whom we gave no such commandment. So in this particular letter, they said, we didn't... We, don't listen to them. They're not, they're not speaking on our behalf. In other words, they say you need to be circumcised. We never authorized them to do that. So they're not coming on our behalf. And so we, we didn't give them that commandment, and we, we asked for you to ignore them. So this would have been seen as a, a warning against false teachers, right? In fact, these were false teachers who had left them. There's some of us. They've come out from among us. And so a local congregation sent a letter saying, we're warning you about this. And we don't have any part in it. So autonomy sometimes is used as a shield to defend people's false practices or false teaching. Acts 15 shows that it cannot be used that way. The apostles, the elders, the brethren sent letters. And, when, and they confronted the error of the Gentiles, but they also confronted and warned other congregations of false teachers. Autonomy also does not mean that local congregations can surrender oversight specifically granted to the local church. In other words, it would be wrong for us to uh, authorize another congregation to oversee some work we're doing. And I don't know why anybody would want to do that in the first place. I mean, if we're doing the work, it makes sense that we would want to have say over it. We would want to have the oversight over it, right? But for some reason, 
it is the case that uh, local congregations uh, working together, and there's nothing in and of that of itself wrong with local congregations working together, except when they sacrifice oversight of a local work to somebody else. Because what happens is you end up having one eldership overseeing a work of other congregations, which we know is unscriptural. And we'll get into it in a moment. There is a difference, once again, between a congregation helping another congregation and a congregation sacrificing its authority to oversee a work to somebody else. There's a big difference in that. Some congregations have unscripturally outsourced the works of the church, such as evangelism, to other congregations or to other institutions or other organizations that are not the church. When the Bible, obviously, as we pointed out, through expression of autonomy, shows that each local congregation is, is responsible for its own evangelism and benevolence. In other words, the church doesn't need an outside organization to perform those duties for it. And to outsource those works to something else or someone else is not authorized by autonomy. See, somebody might say, well, we chose to do that. Well, you can choose to do it, but that doesn't mean God authorized you to choose to do that. I've heard individuals say, well, if the elders agree to it, then it's right. Well, if the elders agree to it and God authorized it, it's right. But just, <laughs> I mean, the elders can authorize something for the local work, but they might authorize something wrong. And if they authorize something wrong, then it's wrong, you know, because it's, it's God's word that matters. They're to answer to the chief shepherd. So just because an eldership says to do something doesn't mean it's right. What makes it right is when the eldership does something that's authorized by God. That's what makes it right. So some congregations have outsourced the works of evangelism and benevolence to either other congregations, let them do it on our behalf, or two, to an organization or institution that is not the local church, neither of which are authorized by the scripture. We also note that autonomy does not mean that local congregations can't help other congregations. We saw in Acts chapter 15 that there was letters sent to another congregation to help them, warning them of a false teacher. Now that's a help. That's one way in which a congregation can help. In Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, <clears throat> Paul writes to the church at uh, Galatia, he says, and this has, to, this, is, this has to do with Acts chapter 15, by the way, the idea of uh, churches being commanded to participate in circumcision when it wasn't authorized in the New Testament. So he says that when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, and seemed to be means they were recognized as pillars by those in that community, perceived the grace that was given to me, Paul says, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go in unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So here Paul and Barnabas come into another congregation, and that congregation had respect for James and Peter and John, and they saw uh, that Paul and Barnabas were uh, in fellowship with them and, and teaching the truth. And so what did they do? They didn't remain separate from Paul and Barnabas. They extended fellowship to them too. And so then they, there's a cooperation taking place. They should go to the heathen or the Gentiles, and, or that we should go to the Gentile, and they go to the circumcision. Now, that's authorized because the Great Commission says, go ye into all the world. Right? And God doesn't necessarily say how to go into all the world. He just says, go into all the world. So if two men want to go to this side and two men want to go to that side, that's fine. That's how they divided it up. But they were working together and... and Note what they were working together to do, to preach the gospel. They were, they were going to preach the gospel 
to different groups of individuals. And they were working together to get this done. In, uh, in Acts chapter 11, Acts chapter 11, verse 19, beginning, Uh, they when, uh, now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenice and Cyprus and Antioch preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only at this particular time. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene which when they were come to Antioch spake unto the Grecians preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them and a great number believed and tur turned to the Lord. Then tidings of these things came to the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that he should uh, go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and much people was added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year after they assembled themselves with the church, that local congregation, and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first to Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch, one congregation sending individuals to another congregation. And there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth or famine throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples... Every man according to his ability determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. So there was a need for help because of a famine in another area where congregations were located in meeting. And they come to these brethren in Antioch and said, because of this famine, we're in need. And so the disciples in that congregation determined to send relief, and it seems here that they gave up even more than they normally would. So uh, they gave their collection on the first day of the week. That was as commanded. But in addition to that, it seems that these individuals gave above and beyond what they were commanded. They gave each according to his ability. Which also they did, and sent it by the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So they send this money by the hands of Barnabas and Saul to Jerusalem to take care of this need. And so we see here congregations working together as it pertains to benevolence. And we see that uh, they sent it by Barnabas and Saul. That's just because that was the means they chose. Today we might send it by post office or FedEx or UPS. We might drive it there ourselves, right? God didn't command how to get it there, but God authorized it being done because these apostles participated in this work. And I might note uh, that some people say that this authorizes sending finances from one congregation to another for the means of benevolence, but not to help preach the Word of God. That there's no example of a congregation sending money to another congregation to preach or to evangelize. And that's true. There's no example of that. But that's not, that, uh, well, that would be a good argument if example was the only way God authorized. God doesn't authorize just by example only. You know, there's no example of me getting to church on Sunday by car. Right? There's not. So I don't have to have an example. Example is just one way God authorizes. God also authorizes by command. When God said, assemble yourselves together upon the first day of the week, that's my command to get to services on the first day of the week. He didn't tell me how to get there. But I need to get there so I can use whatever means is necessary to get there because God didn't de deny any means to get there. So when God gave the great commission, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, that's the great commission, the ultimate commission of the church. That command was given to each individual, go ye. It was given to the church local, and it was given to the church universal. This is the great commission. 
And God considered preaching the gospel and sending people to preach the gospel so uh, needed for the, work, for the church to exist and to be established and to work that in Acts chapter 4 we read of people selling their houses and selling their possessions to give money for the gospel to be preached. Now there's no example of anybody selling their possessions and houses for just for any other reason. The need was so great, these individuals, it was so Im of a great importance that they did this thing. Now, they didn't have to, but they did. But consider if it is the case that we have to look only to one example and we can't consider the Great Commission, the command to go preach the gospel to every creature, and we consider, let's say this church at Judea needed somebody to preach, and we say, well, we can't send any money to help you preach but we can send money to help you eat. Then that would mean that God is more concerned about their physical diet than their spiritual diet, right? If God said, well, you can send them money to eat on, but you can't send them any money to help preach the gospel there. In other words, they're going to live because they're going to eat, but they're going to die spiritually because they don't have any spiritual nutrition. And, of course, in Luke chapter 12, the Bible tells us that life is more than meat, right, and the body raiment. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's what God tells us in Matthew 6, verse 33. So God authorizes not just by example, but by command and by inference. And by inference, I don't mean a matter of opinion. Uh, unfortunately, I had a discussion with some individuals about inference and um, it didn't go well because the majority of people took the side of whatever they googled and when they googled inference it basically made it sound like an opinion but here's the truth about inference you can't infer anything that's not implied first by God if God didn't imply it you better not be inferring it okay so it's not a matter of opinion. If, if, if it's infer, if we infer it, it better be implied by God. Right? So, that's free. Last, and very quickly, what autonomy does mean. It does mean that local congregations are expected to do the work of the Lord. We started the whole sermon. We're to assemble. We're to preach. We're to edify. We're to be benevolent. We're to remain pure. We're to discipline ourselves. Uh, we're to take up a collection to provide for our needs. We're to do the work of the Lord locally. That's what autonomy means. Local uh, congregations have freedom to execute God's laws as they see best. As long as they, those means are authorized by God. We use a songbook. Because we see that as the expedient way to obey the command to sing. So we use finances, if we, may, if we want to, on buying songbooks. But it's not because uh, necessarily we think it's the right thing to do. It's because we're commanded to sing and we're authorized to have those things that are necessary to help us obey that command. We talked about that last week. God, uh, meeting times, gospel meetings, uh, Wednesday night Bible services, Order of worship, two songs, three songs, prayer, Lord's Supper, sermon first, whichever one. Those are matters of opinion. Those all have to take place on a Sunday. God's command was these things are to be done upon the first day of the week. But the order was never given to us. And so the local congregation can determine for itself what's, what's expedient for them to get this work done. Do we meet at 9.30? Do we meet at 10.30? Do we do sermon first, Bible class first? Those are matters uh, of opinion that are left to the local congregation. In uh, Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, Paul says, Ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated or sent funds to me uh, with me as concerning giving and receiving. So communicated there has to do with fellowship. As it pertained to giving, 
and receiving. Uh, except you only, which means one congregation of its own accord chose to do it, and some chose not to do it. Now, whether those that chose not to do it were wrong, we're not told. But we know that only one did it, and they did it of their own accord. They were self-directed. Uh, notice verse 16, For even in Thessalonica you sent once and again unto my necessity. So this authorized, Paul's saying that what you did was right, Number one, because he approved of it, apostolic approval. And number two, uh, since they were the only one that did it, it wasn't a command to everybody. It's a command to be benevolent. It's a command to help evangelism. But the church at Philippi chose to do it one way, and others obviously chose to do it a different way. So that expresses the idea of autonomy. Autonomy also means that local congregations have the choice to participate or not to participate in any actions that might be scriptural but are not commanded. And we see that in Philippians chapter 4. There was no command to each congregation, you must send Paul money. But, some, but at least one did, which gave it apostolic approval, if others wanted to do it. But just because one congregation does something, even if it's scriptural, doesn't mean we have to do it. And sadly today, a lot of congregations say, look at them, let, they're doing it, we're going to do it. And it may not be scriptural. They don't even care if it's scriptural. That should be the first question is whether it's right with God. But even if it is right with God, it doesn't mean we have to do it. <laughs> you don't have to do it. That's self-directing. The local congregation has that authority. So autonomy is a principle that is obviously taught throughout the New Testament. It's a principle intended to ensure the strength of the local congregation and ensure that apostasy from outside sources don't creep in. And since this, like any other biblical principle, can be perverted, we ought to have our eyes wide open. We must seek to simply do what God says to do in all things that we say and do. And if that's our attitude and that's what we're looking for in the Scripture, then we will remain true to God. The Bible teaches us that in order to be a Christian, one must have faith, and faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. That faith must be a living faith that leads us to repent of our sins, confess that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and to be baptized in water to have our past sins washed away, Acts 22, verse 16. Upon that obedience, God will add those individuals to his church, Acts 2, verse 47, where we live to serve God until the very end, Revelation 2, verse 10, where those who are found to be faithful will receive a crown of life. That's why we're here today, and if you've not obeyed the invitation, we extend it to you today. If you've already obeyed those initial acts but have something else in your life, uh, if we can assist you in any way, come now as we stand and sing.